Okay, great. I think we've um, got the majority of people in, so we'll begin. Thanks so much for waiting. Um, so, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us on this webinar today, where we'll be presenting our proposal for the Grimsby Solar Farm. So sorry we're not able to meet up in person due to the current situation, but we hope that this will still get a good view of our proposals across to you and allow us to answer all of your questions. So I'm Chloe and I'm the Community Liaison Manager here at Aura Power and I'm joined by Chris, our UK Development Manager, Claire from Angina, our Planning Consultant, and Sophie, our PR and Comms Consultant, who's also helping with community engagement. So before we go into the proposal itself, I just want to explain to you exactly how this webinar will work. So we'll take about 30 minutes presenting the plans and then open up the virtual floor for any questions you may have for us to answer. So your microphones will be muted for all of the session, but you should see a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen where you can type your question for us to then answer out loud. We'll only be answering questions once we have presented our plans, so please feel free to type your question at any time during this session. However, I would advise waiting till the end in case your question is covered in our presentation. So this webinar is also being recorded and will be available to watch again on our website. If you are watching the recorded version and have a question that has not been addressed, please do contact us. So just checking that we were actually recording. Um, we'll also make the presentation slides available to download. We'd also like to ask you to complete a short feedback form after the webinar, which I will be sending around uh, following this session. So, who is Aura Power? So we are a renewable energy developer based in Bristol and founded in 2013. We have around 20 staff in total and a dedicated UK team. We have numerous utility scale solar farms and battery storage sites in development, not only in the UK, but also in the Republic of Ireland, Portugal, Italy, Spain, Canada, and the US. So we are a partner of IB Vote, a German engineering firm that's built over a gigawatt of solar farms worldwide and developed projects on a global scale. That equates to over 3 million solar panels with over 80 solar farms of varying sizes, of which more than half are situated in the UK. So with the experience and financial backing of a global company like IB Vote, we have the capability and financial security to see a project all the way through its development process to construction and then on to operation. As a developer, our remit is to develop the solar farm design, engage with the local community and obtain planning permission. It may then be handed over to a partner company to construct and operate. As we all know, we are in a climate emergency. and an ecological emergency. And it's important to recognize why solar can play such an important role in the future of our energy sector. So in 2019, the UK government became the first in the world to set a legally binding target for net zero emissions by 2050. And solar and wind alone are projected to source 50% of the UK's power by this time. We have already seen a substantial increase in wind and solar generation with renewables outpacing fossil fuel generation for the first time last year. Solar alone set a new record on April the 20th last year, meeting 30% of the UK electricity demand. And with the displacement of fossil fuels alongside the electrification of much of the heating and transport sectors, the demand for electricity is expected to rise by a third in the next decade. Solar energy is already proven to be the cheapest form of new electricity generation and the government's recent energy white paper demonstrates the important role it will play to complement wind in the country's future transition to net zero. Furthermore, as it's no longer supported by subsidies, this helps reduce energy prices for everyone. The area around Grimsby is already known as a global leader in offshore wind, but there are also great opportunities here to tap into the power of the sun strengthening its position as the renewable energy capital of the UK. As well as generating clean, renewable energy solar farms, solar farms can enrich local biodiversity and continue the use of ag agriculture via sheep grazing and restore the soil to an even better condition after the solar farm has been decommissioned. As such, we believe that this solar farm will help North East Lincolnshire Council achieve their carbon reduction targets in their vision for a low carbon future, whilst also contributing to biodiversity net gain. 
So this solar farm will have a capacity of 49.9 megawatts, which our calculations have indicated could generate enough electricity to power up to 27,000 typical Northeast Lincolnshire homes and save up to 25,000 tonnes of CO2 from entering the atmosphere each year. So, as you can see from the map here, our proposed site is located approximately three miles to the west of the centre of Grimsby, between Aylesby and Healing. It covers approximately 134 hectares of land and lies in the parish of Aylesby with Ryby. Healing and Laceby are neighbouring parishes. We welcome discussions from any community representatives from parish councils from the neighbouring area. The land is owned by two landowners and is at present used for growing crops. Finding a suitable site for a solar farm can be very difficult and there are many constraints that need to be sensibly considered. We believe this site to be suitable because it is flat and already well screened with existing vegetation with the um, possibility to screen further from, from view and very close to the substation that connects directly into the electricity network. We have all already secured a viable grid connection for 49.9 megawatts of export capacity with Northern Power Grid. It is also not subject to any land or environmental designations and all footpaths will be retained. So I'm going to hand over to Chris to explain why this site. Thanks, Chloe. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so yes, why this site? Um, well, as well as the grid connection and the suitability of the land that Chloe has already explained, um, the site is also suitable for a number of other reasons. Um, so firstly, there are, addition, there are good levels of sunlight in this part of the country. This, along with enough flat land and a viable grid connection, allows a solar farm to generate enough clean electricity to become commercially viable. There is an excellent potential for the solar farm to be screened entirely with, the, um, with perimeter hedgerows, enhancing the landscape and biodiversity. Um, from the A18, there is also good access to the site. Um, the landowners have also expressed an interest in grazing sheep under the panels, which would help to keep the land used for food production. We have also undertaken a number of environmental studies, which include archaeology, flood risk, traffic, noise and ecology, amongst others. The results of which have allowed us to minimise any potential disruption and found that the impact of the solar farm on the surrounding area would be low, and we believe acceptable. Uh, ecologically sensitive areas have also been avoided throughout the site. So what, what makes up a solar farm? Um, there are a number of different components that make up a solar farm. Um, PV panels, as you probably uh, know, make up of, of the vast majority of the installation. Um, however, on this site, and this is quite unusual in the, in the UK, um, we're using, well, we're proposing to use tracking panels which follow the sun from east to west during the day, so that the rows are oriented north to south. Um, by using a tracking system as, as opposed to fixed tilt, the gain in energy output at this site is considerably higher. Um, this means more homes will be powered by carbon-free energy per year. The panels will reach a maximum height of 3.5 metres um, and they'll reach that maximum height um, first thing in the morning and, and last thing in the evening um, and we'll have, uh, we'll, we'll, during the day we'll reach a maximum height of 2.4 metres uh, when the sun is directly overhead. Um, they are set out in rows with a minimum 4.6 metres between each row um, and the simulation here shows a proposed panel layout at each side of the point in the day. So yeah, there you can see the panels um, throughout the different times of the day. Um, okay, um, so other parts of the solar farm, uh, fencing. Um, there'll be a two metre uh, deer fence around the perimeter with space for small mammals to pass through. Um, there'll also be access tracks um, and new access tracks uh, would be built, um, although we would endeavour to use existing access tracks where possible. Any new access tracks would have the appearance of a typical vernacular farm track with a crushed stone surface, uh, typically four metres in width. The tracks would be allowed to grass over in time. Um, another key component of the solar farm installation would be inverters, um, which would be, we'd be using string inverters on this installation, um, and they'd be located in the centre of the array and convert power from DC to AC. 
uh, transformers would also be part of the scheme um, and they're used to step the power up from the inverters um, in order to export to the grid um, which then distributes electricity across the country. Um, storage units would also contain spare parts um, and a substation is where we would connect our uh, energy into the grid network um, that then feeds the larger substation just to the east, east of our site, um, which as you may know is, is called Grimsby West. Um, the 16 meter by 12 meter compound would contain a number of electrical infrastructure components, an office and a storage building surrounded by 2.45 meter, meter high fencing. Um, there would also be temporary construction compound. This would be an area within the site for construction deliveries. Um, and finally, there'll be a series of, of underground cables that would connect the panels to the transformers and then onto the substation 500 meters away. Okay, um, so as Chloe mentioned previously, we'll be using tracking panels, um, which track the sun during the day to absorb as much sunlight as possible. These panel types require more space than fixed panels and hence why our site is of this size. The panel arrays cover 32% of the total site and will only disturb a very small proportion of the ground, less than 1%, um, as it is only the posts that are panel driven into the ground for the panels to sit, sit on top of. This allows plenty of space for sheep to graze safely beneath them. The grass can still grow under the panels on a UK solar farm, despite the misconception that the shade prevents it from doing so. And indeed the panels can afford the sheep some protection from, from bad weather. The substation on the east of our site um, is close to the existing substation. Um, and this is where, as we said earlier, we could connect into the electricity, into the grid to supply clean energy to your homes. Um, for this particular project, we'll be using monocrystalline silicon-based solar panels, which will have up to 96% recycling efficiency. The operational period of this solar farm would be 35 years. Um, and once the end of the operational period is reached, the solar farm will be decommissioned and the land returned back to its former state. Um, and we would hope that it would be in a considerably better state than it was before, as no pesticides would have been used, um, or indeed fertilizers would have been used for the duration of, of the operational life of the solar farm. Um, in addition to the solar panels and associated infrastructure, the proposal includes elements of ecological and landscape enhancement, such as tree planting, hedgerow enrichment, and wildflowers. We are retaining all existing vegetation in and around the site. The northern boundary has existing hedgerows for much of its length, and we are proposing to reinforce these with additional rows of hedgerow planting to offer additional screening. The remaining site perimeter will be planted with new hedgerows at a 10 meter width that are anticipated to grow uh, to at least four meters within 10 years to completely screen the solar farm. You will see later on the visual impact before and after. We'll discuss later on how this will have a significant impact on the enhanced biodiversity around the site. Internal hedgerow lines will also be in reinforced, which again offers some screening, but it's principally to create better connected habitats across the site. Native species of hedges will include blackthorn, dog rose, hawthorn hazel, holly, purging blackthorn and wild privet. Wildflowers will be planted um, to, to attract uh, insects, farm, farmland bees and bats to help tackle the ecological crisis. The path that runs through the site from Aylesby to Healing will remain and we have conserved the immunity for users by creating a wide green corridor. These areas could have much amenity value as well as educational uh, value by installing information boards to inform users of the solar farm, wildlife, climate change, etc. New hedgerows would be planted to either side of the path and we have a visualization later on of what this could look like. There is no security lighting when the solar farm is operational. The only lighting that may be in place will be during construction. However, as construction will probably only take place during daylight hours with lighting requirements will be minimal. Okay, thank you, Chloe. Um, so this slide uh, shows where the solar farm will be most visible um, and what it's predicted to look like from a number of viewpoints before and after the planting takes effect. So the viewpoints you can see here have been agreed with the council uh, to provide the widest representation for a range of receptors. Um, so if we move on to the next slide, please, Chloe. Okay, um, so, is, yeah, sorry, thank you, <laughs> um, thanks. So this, the pink area shows where you can see some of the solar farm from an eye level of around 1.8 meters. This particular model shows where you can see the solar farm from 
from how it is today, taking account of some of the existing obstructions such as woodlands and buildings. Whilst the pink shading may look a lot, if you look closely, you will see that it avoids the majority of residences, including the villages of Healing, Aylesby and Laceby. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and this model shows the extent of the visibility after around 10 years when all of the perimeter planting has grown to four meters. As you can see, it is almost entirely screened from view. So the difference there between that slide and the previous slide is quite profound. Um, okay, um, next slide, please. Uh, thanks. So this view is taken from the southern end of Aylesby Lane that runs through the middle of the site from Aylesby to Healing. The top photo shows the current view, the middle photo shows the view just after the solar farm has been built, and the bottom photo shows a projected view 10 years after when the hedges have grown to around four meters. So as you can see, the, the, the effects of the planting are, are quite profound. Um, okay, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, this viewpoint is taken a few hundred meters below the previous one, still on the path, but just outside our proposed site. Again, you can see here the solar farm just after it's been built, then 10 years later, once the hedges have grown and completely screened the view. Next slide, please. Thank you. This viewpoint is taken from the healing end of the footpath, just outside the proposed site. Uh, beyond the existing trees. Again, the top image shows the current view, the middle just after the solar farm has been built, and the bottom 10 years after once the planting has closed the gaps in the hedge and completely screened the solar farm from view. Uh, next slide, please, Craig. Thank you. This viewpoint is taken one kilometer southwest of the site boundary, just to the east of the A18. You can make out the arrays on the horizon line underneath the pylons, but again, after 10 years, the view is screened entirely. It should be noted that as solar farms are very quiet, we do not predict any adverse effects on residential receptors nearby. Uh, next slide, please, Claire. Thank you. Um, so construction and access. The construction of a solar farm will take place over a, a six month period, which we hope will commence around about six months after a planning decision has been made. Um, the proposed route will avoid the nearby villages and come in off the A18, down Beach Holt Lane and straight onto the access road that leads to the west of the site. Where possible, we would use the existing field access tracks to reach areas of panels further within the solar farm site, and compacted gravel will be used where those access tracks are not adequate for HGVs. The new access tracks will be constructed approximately four metres wide. Whilst the existing access into the site is good, we may look to improve this for construction purposes, whilst keeping hedgerow losses to a minimum for appropriate visibility displays. During construction, traffic management will be in place on the approach to the site on the A18. All roads will remain open and traffic will be managed accordingly by transport controllers, ensuring public safety and the efficient delivery and movement of construction vehicles. No exceptional loads are required as deliveries are all contained to standard HGV or smaller lorries. Peak construction traffic will take place over the first few weeks of construction, after which the number of HGVs coming to and from the site will reduce quite significantly. HGV movements will only happen outside peak times and a contact number will be made available for any residents who have any concerns over this period. As a solar farm requires little maintenance, after construction, there'll be minimal traffic going into the site. And furthermore, a traffic statement will be submitted with the application and a full traffic management plan will be produced prior to construction. Thanks, Chris. Okay, so biodiversity enhancement. So a growing body of scientific evidence indicates that solar farms can significantly improve local biodiversity and even help address the UK's biodiversity crisis by providing habitats and food for wildlife. This is not only due to there being less intervention on the land compared with when the land was farmed with pesticides and fertilizers perhaps, but also due to the measures developers like us are putting in place to promote biodiversity. Furthermore, as the panels generally sit on piles, there is minimal disturbance to the ground, which allows the grass to continue to grow and the potential for sheep to graze beneath them. Arable fields are converted to species rich pasture with wildflower meadows acting as a stable store of carbon, a dual benefit to combat climate change and boost biodiversity. 
As the fields are left fallow for the duration of the solar farm is in situ, the soil will be kept healthy, boosts carbon sequestration, and after the solar farm has reached the end of its life, it can be removed up to 96% recycled and the land will be returned to its previous state, or in some cases, an even better one than before. A solar farm is a bit like a wildlife reserve. The land is being taken out of intensive agricultural production and largely left to return to nature. So throughout the site, we have endeavoured to build the panels and infrastructure around existing hedges, trees and ponds, and any vegetation removal will be kept minimal and only for the purposes of access if required. Wildflowers will be planted across the whole site, which will be cut annually in September after they have set seed. As Chris outlined earlier, we will also be planting 1.7 kilometres of new hedgerow and enhancing 4.4 kilometres of existing hedgerow, as well as planting 3.1 kilometres of new thickets around the southeast and northeast perimeter. The existing woodlands around the perimeter will be retained. So this will allow for a significant net gain in biodiversity and greatly benefit local wildlife, estimated to be an increase of around 69% with a 273% increase in new hedgerows. The fence will allow for small mammals to cross the site. A recent study by the then Solar Trade Association discovered that some solar farms had up to six times more pollinators than adjacent fields without solar panels on. With this in mind, there is an opportunity here to install beehives. And if this is something that you might be interested in helping us with, then we'd love to hear from you. So I'm going to pass over to Claire now, who's going to discuss how we're going to um, monitor this. Thanks, Chloe. Good evening, everybody. So as Chloe mentioned, there will be a number of uh, biodiversity enhancements with the scheme. Uh, we'll be producing a landscape and ecological management plan, or LEMP, to uh, ensure that the biodiversity gains discussed are maximised through the life of the scheme. The LEMP will uh, specify things such as where and how existing vegetation will be enhanced, the density of new meadow, hedges and trees, the species mix for the various habitats, how habitats will be, will be protected during the construction phase and how habitats will be maintained. The plan will be discussed and agreed with North East Lincolnshire Council and will outline the management regime of the solar farm to ensure the anticipated biodiversity net gain is achieved over the life of the project. Progression of the habitats will be monitored annually and a report will be submitted to the council annually for the first three years and then yearly for, uh, oh, sorry, three yearly thereafter. The LEMP will be regularly reviewed and if necessary adapted in agreement with the council through the life of the project to ensure that the biodiversity aims are continually met. Next slide, please, Chloe. As we've touched upon, there are a number of environmental assessments that are underway for the project. Um, they are all being undertaken by specialist consultants in the field. Uh, not all the results are in yet, but I'll go through um, what we have so far. In terms of ecology, uh, a phase one habitat survey, including a water body inspection for great crested newt, has been undertaken and also breeding bird surveys have been completed on the site. There are no ecological designations on the site and those in the wider area have been considered in determining the appropriate scope of surveys. The surveys to, uh, on the site have found that there's been a typical assemblage of uh, farmland birds, um, nothing uh, out of the ordinary or as um, to be unexpected. Uh, measures such as buffers around ditches and hedges have been incorporated into the design to avoid impacts on uh, habitats and wildlife. So an environmental, um, sorry, landscape and, and visual impact assessment is underway. Uh, this includes a site visit by a landscape architect and consultation with the council. The LVIA will include assessment of impacts on landscape character and visual impacts for a range of receptors such as residents, road and rail users and users of the public right of way. As you've seen, visualisations and visibility modelling will supplement the written statement, which will be part of the planning application, and mitigations proposed uh, to reduce the visual impact. 
Heritage. Uh, we've been progressing quite a lot of work on this aspect in consultation with the council. A desk-based assessment with site visit has been undertaken to consider the potential impacts on designated and non-designated assets. So this includes listed buildings, uh, conservation areas and scheduled monuments. There are no designated assets within the site and the assessment finds that there will be a negligible impact on the significance of only seven listed buildings. In addition, a geophysical survey has been undertaken, which has shown low potential for archaeological features within the site area, and the impact of modern activity is evident across the site. Consultation with the Heritage Officer is ongoing, and on her advice, we will be undertaking trial trenching of the site shortly to further investigate the potential heritage impacts, although overall we feel this is low. To um, consider amenity of surrounding residents uh, upon the finalised uh, site design, noise and glint and glare assessments will be completed. In terms of noise, as Chris mentioned, string inverters are proposed and these are very quiet. They're very similar to the inverters that you would have uh, in your homes for domestic solar panel installations. And uh, in the domestic setting, obviously these inverters are installed within the dwelling in garages or in attics, that sort of thing. To minimise the potential impact, electrical infrastructure such as the inverters and the transformers are located as far from residential dwellings as possible. And also on the landscape uh, side, screening will um, improve the potential uh, for glint and glare. And finally, flood risk and surf surface water drainage. Um, the site is entirely in flood zone one, which means it's got a very low probability of flooding from rivers and the sea. There are small pockets on the site where there is potential for surface water flooding. And this surface water flood risk map has been used during the design stage to uh, ensure that no electrical infrastructure is located in these areas. A flood risk assessment and surface water drainage strategy will be submitted with the application. And overall, we don't believe there will be uh, any negligible impacts on flood risk. I'll now hand over to uh, Sophie, who will talk you through the local benefits. Um, thank you, Claire. Um, so um, the solar farm will contribute about £100,000 a year in business rates to North East Lincolnshire Council, which uh, will be retained by the council. Um, it will create jobs during the construction of the project and within the supply chain, um, about uh, 25 full-time equivalent jobs um, in the supply chain, uh, plus um, local jobs for maintenance of, um, of the land and the hedgerows around the solar farm. Um, and then obviously when the solar farm is being built, there will be contractors who will come in from outside the area who will stay locally and use local services for the period of the solar farm's construction. As well as this, um, we're proposing a community benefit fund of £350 per megawatt, which is index linked. So that's per megawatt per year for the lifetime of the solar farm um, to be spent on local social and environmental projects. So for a site of this size, we would expect this to be around £17,000 a year for 40 years or over £600,000 in total. Um, this, the community benefit fund is very much to be managed locally by local people um, with, with local decisions on how the money should be spent. Um, we very much welcome your suggestions on uh, projects and initiatives that would benefit from the funding um, and how you would like to see the Community Benefit Fund administered. We've got, we've got a question in this in our feedback survey, so it would be fantastic if you could uh, let us know what you think the money should be spent on. Um, it's also very important to us that the solar farm should benefit the younger generation. Um, and so we have an educational program that's, that's built into the Community Benefit Fund. We're setting aside £2,000 a year to be spent on educational initiatives linked to the solar farm. We work already with a very good, well-established company um, that has developed a great program of delivering site visits to solar farms. Um, 
educational sessions in schools when these are allowed, um, not allowed at the moment, sadly, um, but they have, they are developing um, some, some remote learning facilities and hopefully that things will start to get back to normal by the time the, the solar farm is built. Um, if you um, know of any local schools or teachers that will be interested in participating in this, please do encourage them to get in contact with us. Thanks, and now that's uh, over to Chloe again. Brilliant, thanks very much, Sophie, Claire and Chris. Um, so time scales then. So public consultation is obviously very important to us and also a crucial part of the planning process. Following this consultation, we will look to incorporate the views of the local community and interested parties into our proposal and revise any designs if necessary. We will then finalise our proposed design and aim to submit our planning application in the spring this year. North East Lincolnshire Council has provided pre-application advice. We will be furthering discussions with the specialist consultees identified and addressing the comments raised in our planning application. Our aim is to submit a proposal which complies fully with the North East Lincolnshire local plan, the North Lincolnshire core strategy and the national planning policy framework. There will also be a formal round of public consultation led by the planning authority where you will be able to upload your comments to the planning page once we have submitted our application. Surrounding residents will be notified by North East Lincolnshire planning authority, but we will also, also notify all attendees to this webinar by email. So the planning determination period for developments of this scale can take anything from 13 weeks up to 32 weeks, but we'd hope to have a decision towards the end of the summer moving into autumn. And if approved, we'll look to construct, start construction in the summer of 2022. So we've come to the end of uh, presenting our initial plans for our proposal. And thank you very much for listening. So we'll now answer any questions that you have. And if you haven't already done so, then please type your question using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. I will then read that question out loud and one of our panellists will answer. So we hope that we can answer all of your questions during the session, but if we're unable to, then please do contact us. So I have had some questions already submitted by uh, a local resident, which I wanted to answer during this webinar. So one of the questions was, has, has the brownfield sites on the Humber Bank been considered? And if so, what, would, what have the reasons why any plans have not progressed? So, as Chris mentioned earlier in our presentation, when looking for a suitable site, one of the most important factors is proximity to the grid, with sufficient capacity to connect into. As much of the UK grid network is quite saturated, finding a pocket on the line is not that easy to come by. We secured a 49.9 megawatt grid connection into the Grimsby West grid supply point substation, which is just 500 metres directly to the east of our site back at the start of 2019. This then acts as a starting point for finding suitable land, not least with a willing landowner, but also that avoids the many constraints such as scheduled monuments, numerous planning, numerous public rights of ways, flood zones, landscape designations, and so on. So we do consider brownfield sites for our developments, but not only for the aforementioned reasons might they not be suitable, but they are often in demand for other residential or commercial development, which offers higher investment returns than solar. So the other question that we were asked um, by this particular resident was that the land is still in full production of arable crops and each year counting towards reduction of CO2. This productive land would appear to be more important now, not less post-Brexit. Does the landowner have any plans to continue using the land in a different form, i.e. sheep grazing? Um, so yes, our landowners have expressed interest in grazing sheep, which will not only continue its agricultural use, but also help maintain the land. Um, as we've previously mentioned, the land will also act as a carbon store with wildflower meadows planted and returned to its former state after the life cycle of the solar farm, having given the soil time to rest and restore and be used once again for food production. The uncertainty of subsidies post Brexit and unpredictable weather has also left farmers seeking alternative and more reliable income streams. So another question that was asked as well is why is this proposed development so large? So as Chris mentioned earlier, we're using trackers at this site, which require a larger land take than the fixed panels at uh, other sites. So this, this is the direction that most solar farm development is now going in. 
The site is also quite constrained, meaning there are a number of areas where we cannot put panels, i.e. setbacks from transmission lines, the two turbines that are already positioned on site, um, various buffers, and also the Hornsey 1 and 2 underground cables which run uh, across the site as well. So another question um, that was asked was, what is the employment change envisaged? Um, so I think Sophie mentioned uh, the answer to this one earlier and said that the expected, um, the overall solar farm of this size would expect to contribute about 25 full-time equivalent jobs through the supply chain. Um, there is little maintenance required for solar panels and electrical infrastructure. However, there will be ongoing land maintenance, for example, the hedgerows, et cetera. And this will be similar to agricultural work. So during construction, there will be a lot of labor employed at the site, which may not be local, although our EPC will use some local labor for some of the work, but which will contribute to the local economy, for example, staying in the B&Bs and supporting local businesses, et cetera. So another of the question that was asked is, um, if our site is so large in anticipation of the government removing the 50 megawatt cap for solar sites to be reviewed, by the Secretary of State, so we can increase energy output. So we can't comment on the legislation surrounding the 50 megawatt threshold and have not factored this into our layout. So another question from this particular uh, resident was how does the local community benefit as more production rises? Um, the fund doesn't feel very generous and we have already seen significant disruption from Hornsey 1 and 2, so it would be good to see some long-term benefits especially for the younger population, given this project is all about providing for and protecting the future. So the Community Benefit Fund is a voluntary contribution and not one made by all developers. The amount we are offering per megawatt is actually the highest we are seeing compared with other, other solar developers in the current post-subsidy environment. Since subsidies were cut, profit margins have become a lot smaller so the decision of how these funds are to be spent is one that should be made by local people, for local people, and we encourage projects which support environmental and social causes, particularly in protecting the future for younger generations. As Sophie mentioned as well, our educational fund is designed to inspire and educate the younger generation to protect our planet and decarbonise our economy. So I'm just going to go into our questions um, now. Okay, so we have one question here. I'll just read the questions out loud and then we'll answer them. So if the intention is to graze sheep livestock production, then there won't be a wildflower meadow to harvest once a year. If your intention, not sure about your biodiversity enhancements, if your intention is to sow wildflowers across the whole site. Okay, does somebody wanna take that one? Oh, I'm happy to take that one, Chloe. Um, so yes, um, it, 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 it's a good question, um, but the solar farm biodiversity is gener gener generally managed. You have the sheep grazing in the autumn and winter, so the flowers are allowed to flourish in spring and summer, and then after they've set seed, um, you can bring the sheep on to, to the ground, to the land to allow them to graze. So it's quite compatible to have um, sheep grazing and wildflower meadows at solar farms. It's being done in lots of solar farms throughout the country. Brilliant, thanks Sophie. Um, so the next question that we have here is that the existing solar farm is contributing £70,000 per annum to local projects. This has been very well received by local parishes. Can you explain the vast difference? Can this figure be brought up to this level? Uh, Sophie, did you want to take that one as well? Yeah, sure. Okay, so yes, you're quite right. Um, uh, solar farms that were built before 2015 do have much higher levels of community benefit and that's because um, we had the luxury of subsidies to, unpin, to underpin the profitability of solar farms. Um, sadly, we're now competing on a level playing field. There are no subsidies and community benefit funds have had to fall very dramatically. But actually, the, the fund that we're offering at this site now is one of the highest uh, amounts per megawatt that any developers are offering uh, that we're aware of in the current um, economic climate. So yes, it, it, 
it's it's not as much as it was but also you know solar farms are tending to be a bit larger now which does help to to increase increase the amount um but um um as yeah it's it's not as it's not as much as it was pre-2015 because there's no subsidies Thanks very much, Sophie. Um, so another question that we have here is that the Community Benefit Fund would be open to local applications. What do you call local? Is it Aylesby, Laceby and Healing or wider? Um, I'll start this one and then Sophie, if you want to join in. I mean, by, by local, it, it, it's exactly that. So, you know, we, we've, we've, um, ha we've reached out to the local parishes so exactly at Aylesby, Laceby, Healing and Ryby and we're opening up those discussions from this point um, with the local community and parish councils and any other interested parties on on how and where those funds are to be spent. I mean obviously these are initial discussions at the moment and and further concrete discussions can happen should the solar farm be consented. Yeah, I, I just add to that that a, a solar farm has, because it has a very limited, very local impact, then it makes sense for the benefit funds to be focused very much on the on the very local area and the immediate parishes around the solar farm. Um, and again, we're very much hoping to hear from local people on their thoughts on that. Yep, I've already heard from uh, one resident nearby with regards to the uh, Aylesby Church as well. So, um, like Sophie said, we, we'd love to hear your comments on, on where you think those funds could be spent best. Um, okay, next question. I think overall this is a well presented scheme. Thank you very much. Um, in the drive for forward for net zero, this type of project is key. Also good to see local people getting a say on the local funds as well, and not just the council wasting it away. <laughs> okay. Be really good to see local kids from local schools visiting the site to understand renewable energy, net zero, as we secure their future. Um, well, thank you very much. We obviously really agree. And yeah, like Sophie said before, we, we are looking to um, include the local schools um, in-site visits and workshops. Um, so when the solar farm is decommissioned, will the land as it has been developed be used for residential development? Uh, Chris, do you want to take that question? Yep, sure, yeah. Um, so no, there, there are absolutely no plans whatsoever for that. Um, I mean, we, we have, a, Aura Power has a, a, a lease agreement with, with the landowners and that, that is for a solar farm. Um, and as, as we've, we've explained previously, once the solar farm has, has um, um, operated for um, the, the duration of, of, the, of that agreement, we will pack it up and the vast majority, 96% of it will be recycled um, and you know, the, the land will, will be restored to its former condition or, or possibly even a better condition because of all the improvements um, through um, you know, the, the, a lack of fertilizers and, and pesticides that would have otherwise have been sprayed over the land. Um, so the short answer, no, there, there are no plans for housing on, on the land once, once our uh, lease agreement has, has expired. And I think it's worth just adding to that too, that the land is still considered as agricultural land after that. So, so if someone wanted to apply to put housing or residential development on there, they'd have to go through a lengthy and complicated planning process to do so. Okay, thanks Chris, thanks Sophie. Um, so another question here, would the site be made larger over time? Uh, I'll, I'll take that up if you like. Um, no, the, the, the site wouldn't be become larger. The, the, the application um, that we hopefully will make fairly soon will be for a uh, a 49.9 uh, megawatt solar farm and that will remain as is and, and the plans that we, we, we have that you, you, were, you were seeing earlier would, would be the plans for, for that um, so yeah that, that they're not likely to, well, they won't be changing at all. Thanks Chris. Another question here will be interesting to see how the biodiversity increases. Will there be engagement of local people to help with any hedge planting and monitoring of species? Lots of enthusiastic and knowledgeable people, local people who may want to get involved. Um, well, that's 
really great to hear. Um, I, I guess it's not something that obviously our uh, our landscape and eco ecological management plan um, really incorporates in terms of the help of local people in, in terms of the planting. Um, but, you know, the whole point of our consultation now is to understand um, of what people's con concerns are and also you know this is very refreshing on how you might be able to help so it's certainly something that we'd we'd love to discuss further so please feel free to get in touch with me on, on how you think that might uh, assist us okay next question um so planning consent was granted for another soda farm near to immingham in december 2020 why do we need yours as well Okay, good question. Uh, Chris or Sophie, do you want to take that? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, I'll um, take a, a first, first stab if you like. Um, so unfortunately, we, we, and as we alluded to um, in, in the presentation, we are in the midst of a, a climate emergency, an ecological emergency, and, and, um, and you know, we, we need a lot more of, of these things. We need, we, need, we need more wind power, we need more solar power, we need more um, low carbon energy generation um, and that is only set to increase the demand for that is only set to increase as time goes by um, because of the electrification of transport electrification of heating um, and I mean you know the, we, we've, we've perhaps had a bit of a blip over the last year in terms of a, a reduction in, in demand um, but that that will be a very temporary thing and you know, it's set to bounce back very very soon and and indeed increased substantially um, because of the the two reasons I've, I've, I've given um, so yeah we you know, we, 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 we do have have um, a number of solar farms in the UK and, and, it's, and it's great because of all the um, benefits that they bring about in terms of biodiversity and ecological uh, improvements so um, I mean yeah we, we, we need more renewable power so yeah um, so if you, you might have some other yeah just 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 to add to that not only do we need you know it's still an enormous increase in the amount of renewable energy that we're generating in this country to meet our net zero targets um, uh, not just solar offshore wind as well but also um solar is actually the cheapest new form of electricity generation but you know it's cheap cheaper than fossil fuels but it's it is the cheapest new form of power generation of every technology so it's also helping to bring down people's bills which is i think is an important thing to to bear in mind and it's it's subsidy free as well yeah most definitely thanks chris thanks sophie um, okay, so another question here. We have a solar farm west of Laceby. There does not seem to be a lot of biodiversity, wildflowers, beehives, sheep, etc. Metal flaps for wild animals don't appear to be used, monitored once a year, then every three years, and also no hedges. Also, £17,000 per year does not seem a lot. Okay, um, that's that's noted. I, I, does anyone have any comments to address with that one? Um, well, I just say that the, the other solar farm near Laceby may not have been developed and planned with biodiversity in mind, um, but this one is, and, and that, I think that is an important differentiator um, between different solar farm developers. Um, absolutely, and um, yeah, we, we, we can't speak of the solar farm um, to the west of, of Laceby, but, but we, we can speak about the solar farm that we're talking about today. And, you know, we, we are incredibly proud of the biodiversity uh, net gain that this particular project uh, gives rise to. I mean, it's, it's massive. It's a massive percentage increase in biodiversity improvement. So that's something that we, we are really proud of and, and will want to enhance, if anything. So, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Um, okay, that land is outside of the current local plan. Okay, thanks for that comment. I'll, I'll just add there actually, there are no, um, as far as we're aware, um, allocations within the local plan set aside for renewable developments such as these, which is a shame. Um, we have borne in mind the, uh, the emerging local plans as well. So with the Grimsby West development, we're incorporating a, a buffer on, on the east side of our development to blend the two um, future developments, hopefully. So um, we will fully take into account all the planning policy um, in the planning submission, but thank you for your comment. Um, okay, another question. Can you define or quantify quiet? Will we hear it in healing? Um, Claire, do you, do you want to? Yeah, 
I was just about to jump in, but it looks like we're about to start talking. So, um, yes, uh, so no, you won't hear it in, in healing. Um, a noise assessment is underway and um, we'll publish the results of that in the planning application. I don't have the results at this stage, so I can't give you uh, detailed noise levels around the site, but um, the infrastructure is very quiet and the comparison to the domestic inverters um, is to give some sort of reassurance that they are very quiet machine, uh, um, equipment so um, by you know locating them within the development rather than on the edges uh, then we hope to minimize any potential noise impacts but um, generally you know you won't hear the development at all. Yeah and, and, and just to add that um, the the noise will be will be coming from the inverters um, and as Claire says you know, there'll be very little noise emanating from the solar farm anyway but the inverters will only be operational during uh, during daytime when when, when the solar farm is, is uh, exporting electricity. Um, so there will be no noise uh, at night time. Um, and I can see another question um, asking about uh, battery storage or whether we would be using uh, battery storage for peaking electricity usage. So um, so to sort of tie those two questions together. Um, we, we, we don't have any plans to um, uh, add battery uh, capacity to the solar farm because we, as we alluded to earlier, grid capacity is really difficult to come by, and and we we don't in this case have any uh, import capacity that would facilitate a battery connection. And linking the two questions about noise and, and batteries together, and um, because we don't have uh, the any plans to use batteries, there won't be any any nighttime noise generation whatsoever either. Brilliant. Well, I think that's all of our questions answered. So thank you very much, everyone, for your time this evening. Um, so we would be grateful if you could complete our short survey, which you will receive uh, following this webinar. And if you have anything that you would like to discuss further with us, then please do get in touch with me using the contact details you can see on the screen here. And they're also on our website as well. Um, so if you're watching the recorded version, you can find the feedback questionnaire on our web page and your personal details will not be passed on to any third parties and will only be used for the purpose of this public consultation. So thanks again, everybody, and have a lovely evening. Good night. Thanks. Good night.